right, good morning, everyone. Just trying to delay things because the snow's keeping people out. But we'll go on and get started. Dr. Hatch is going to talk for us this morning. I think most people here probably know him, but uh, a few extra things about Dr. Hatch. He went to, he just gave me his whole schooling rundown. He went to grade school at some school here on campus, high school at East High School, undergrad at the University of Utah. His dad said he had to leave Utah at some point, so he went to med school at Temple. And then he went to the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary for uh, residency. And for those of you who don't know, he does the Pony Express every year and wrote a book about it, which I think is up in our library if anyone actually uh, wants to check it out. Um, he showed me a copy, it's pretty good. And his wife is here with us this morning. So uh, he brought, the, brought part of the Hatch family with him. So we'll, we'll get started. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Dr. Orson White was the first chairman of the Division of Ophthalmology at the University of Utah, and he was practicing downtown at the time. And there was no residency here, and you might say, why have a chairman up here? And there are probably some pretty good reasons. I'll tell you one. I know at least one general surgery resident who thought it would be a delight to add to his resume that he'd done a few cataracts. Now, I suspect that if someone went to Jason and said, I'm a general surgery resident, but I like to do a couple of cataracts for kids. So Jason might look upon it with uh, less than full enthusiasm. And uh, then there's Tom Olbert. He's at the VA right now, and if somebody came to Tom and said, uh, would you mind if I did a couple of your cataracts? I don't know what Tom would say. Maybe he'd say, well, I think I could trade a cataract for three hernias and a gallbladder. <laughs> Laparoscopic, of course. And I think he'd just smile, that Marine smile, and then they'd know not to mess with him. So, Orson attended grade school at the Webster School. He, his family home was on 8th East near about 7th South. And I don't know the Webster School must be in that area, but he also went to uh, uh, the Stewart School on the University of Utah campus for junior high. And it is still standing. The building is still standing. It is the Department of Anthropology. It's located just north of the Pioneer Memorial Theater, but it's, it's still right here on campus. Then he went to East High School. And then he attended the University of Utah, are you ready for this, on a wrestling scholarship. And he became the champion of the intramural sports at the University of Utah in the 152-pound division. He had other, <coughs> other reasons to come to the U, however. Uh, Orson went uh, to the uh, Harvard undergraduate previous to his medical school experience to study astronomy. He was very interested in astronomy and the astronomy teacher there, the professor was someone that he wanted to <coughs> hear from. And so he did that and then he, four years at Harvard Medical School, he served a one year internship in straight medicine at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital and then three years of ophthalmology at the University of California in San Francisco. Sounds a little bit like the University of Utah ophthalmology program. Straight medicine for a year and then three years in residency. Dr. White served. <coughs> well, let me show you. Here's a picture of this family. This is from a Christmas card quite a long time ago. But, uh, a lovely picture of the, of the White family. Dr. White served in the Navy. He was in the uh, Naval Hospital at uh, Newport, Rhode Island for two years, basically. And then he came back and started his practice in Salt Lake City. And he was really getting the practice going pretty nicely when the Navy noticed that actually he was at Newport, Rhode Island a month short of two years. 
So the Navy invited him back in, not for one month, because doctors served for two years. They invited him back for two years. And at that time, he became chief of ophthalmology at the Naval Hospital in Guantanamo. Orson had an interesting experience in Guantanamo. He loved swimming, and he was an expert swimmer. He loved swimming in the ocean. And he was out swimming one day while he was on his Guantanamo cure. And a shark showed some interest in him. <coughs> Orson kept his eye on him, and then the shark turned around and came right at him. Well, Orson happened to have a spear gun with him. And the uh, cool-headed Orson didn't prematurely release the spear, and uh, he just set it firmly against his shoulder and got ready for whatever, and that shot, shark hit with a real thud. It was an awesome collision, and it bent the steel spear, after which the shark went away. It doesn't pay to take on Orson. Even the shark knows that. And <coughs> occasionally, we've had visiting professors come to Salt Lake City many years ago and to give a talk. And if Orson asked a question, then they tried to put him off with the, you guys out in the sticks don't know much, and uh, I'm the big guy. Orson had asked a few more questions. And it, it, if you didn't know the answer to what Orson was asking, you better say don't know. And that shark found out the same thing. Orson had very eclectic interests. He, uh, he was particularly devoted to, uh, he wrote and presented numerous papers on a wide variety of subjects. He was particularly devoted to the Cortis Society in San Francisco uh, where he did his residency. He really liked the Pacific Coast Auto Ophthalmological Society where he served various positions and became its president, and the Utah Ophthalmology Society where he also served as president. And <coughs> he had an exceptionally gifted mind. He was just awesome, well endowed that way. And his papers to the Court of Society, and he presented one every year. He always had something new, and they were so eagerly received and enthusiastically uh, responded to by there that people looked forward to when Orson would have another paper. And uh, I'm deeply honored to have been his friend. Interestingly enough, I knew him through our younger years as well. Our fathers were the first two Utahns to attend Harvard Medical School. Orson loved to fly. His airplane was named N9 or 471 X-ray. Everybody knew his, they might have forgotten Orson's name, but they knew N9 or 471 X-ray. And uh, <coughs> quite a few of uh, Orson, Orson's friends have flown with him. Annette and I have flown with him and his lovely wife, Dora, numerous times. Let's just take a little look at what it's like. Here's. We'll take you on a flight, <coughs> a little shot of the assembly hall in Salt Lake City, and there's Orson by the plane wearing his usual uniform. We had him put on that funny cap from World War I, I think. We found one just as a special little addition. We wanted to show this to the Pacific Coast Auto Ophthalmological Society board to see if they'd want to come to Salt Lake City, and they did so. And here you see the... We flew over the Capitol building. You see some of the uh, <coughs> Temple Square. This is the Salt Lake Country Club, Interstate 80. It's a little shaky in the plane because the plane shakes. It's not totally the photographer. This was taken in late May, uh, late March, probably. Uh, skiing was still going on. So we flew up Mill Creek Canyon first. And then we flew across Mill Creek, on toward Alta, and then on toward Snowbird. This may be just going over Big Cottonwood Canyon. I suspect this may be down in Big Cottonwood Canyon going on the way to Brighton. And then we flew from there on a little further. And Alta would be on this side of things. Maybe the Baldy shoots up there, but this is the top area of the Snowbird Tram. And here's one of the 
one of the snowbird trams right there. That's with the telephoto lens. It looks a little closer than we really were. <laughs> I felt very comfortable flying with Orson. <coughs> and this is down in the snowbird lower parking area in some of the lodge, the first lodges and so on. Good old little Cottonwood Canyon straight shot down into the valley, which had an inversion like we have so much this winter. This may be Mount Superior right here. Well, let's talk about some of <coughs> Orson's writing and papers. Over a year ago, maybe a couple of years ago, I don't see him here. Bob Hoffman, you know Bob? Bob said something at a grand round. He said, you know, Orson White was such a fantastic guy, and he wrote papers. I know he wrote a paper every year, and now those are all lost. It would have been so good to have some acquaintance with them. <coughs> I just sat there quietly. I knew that I had what he was talking about because I have quite a few of his writings and papers. But after a year or whatever, I decided maybe I should talk to Alicia and ask if she could find a grand round slot so we could all get better acquainted with Thorson. It was a real joy that Orson and I assisted each other in surgery. We operated together in those days. Uh, a lot of people did. And after we'd operate, we'd sit and sip a Coke and talk about all kinds of things. I learned so much from that man. It was just wonderful. He was a dear, dear friend. And he was so full of knowledge. It was just awesome. And uh, Orson and Doris, daughter Laurie is here with her husband, Bob McRae. And we're pleased to have them at our grand rounds. That's... That's our pleasure this morning. Dr. White's articles and correspondence cover a wide variety of topics. <clears throat> Let's just touch on some of the highlights. You have four of them in your folder there. Read them. You may not, not at this instant, but <laughs> sometime please read them. You may not find that you understand every detail of every paper. I certainly don't, but, uh, but they're fun. And we'll just talk about some of the highlights of them. Some of the things in these papers correct misconceptions that most or all of us learned, in quotes, in our training. But they have the corrections of the mislearnings that we've had. I'm a dedicated disciple of Orson. I do not understand everything about some of his great papers, but I do accept the truths that seem to challenge many or most of our colleagues. I'd like to start out with something. <coughs> I'm going to, the first question I could ask, I won't ask, I'm going to tell you the answer. The first question I might have asked is, what's the first most important lens of the eye? As light goes toward the front of the eye, toward the back. And the answer is not the cornea. The cornea is not a lens. If you leave here with nothing but that, you're way ahead of the world. You're way ahead of all the other ophthalmologists in, the, in this country, for sure, and probably everywhere. We teach the cornea as a lens, and it isn't. And we'll get into why it isn't. It's a cover. It's like a cover glass. It's <coughs> like looking through a window. It's a curved window, but it's not a lens. Well, if the cornea isn't a lens, <coughs> let's ask the residents. There must be some lenses in the eye. Where's the next lens behind the cornea? And let's assume that we're looking for something with a front curve and a back curve and a refractive index. OK. Beyond the cornea, which isn't a lens, where is that first lens? The aqueous. The aqueous, beautiful. The aqueous is a lens. We'll talk about the details of that, too. Don't forget that. The aqueous is the first lens. The next one's easy. It's what? The lens. Did I hear that? The regular lens of the eye that we all do know about. Is that all? Is there another lens? Is there something else behind that that has a front and back curve? The vitreous. Orson said, that's the most important lens of all. If you're making compound lens system, would it cost more to make a vitreous lens if you're making them out of glass for a telescope or a camera than any other? The, the eye is a three lens system. Orson was published in General Ophthalmology. Thank heaven he got published on his major things somewhere. Because it, the things he did be, for the Pacific Coast Auto Ophthalmological Society 
that were published in the transactions there, I think, are not indexed, so you couldn't get to them there. But he is in general ophthalmology. This little book, which we've seen around. <coughs> Dan Vaughn was a dear friend of Orson's and mine. But he and Orson knew each other very, very well, and Dan thought, Orson, you've got to have some st your stuff in there. And so his, his material on, on optics and the three lens eye and ray tracing that we will talk about a little more, which is the pure way to assess optical systems, and also pressure dynamics in the eye, important in those who are involved in glaucoma. Now, by the way, Orson, when he wanted to study something, he did what I have never done and don't think I could do. If he, <coughs> he went to the original source. If he wanted to study something about pressures within closed systems, he would go to the original writings of Boyle and read it there. He wouldn't go to his college physics book, which is what I would do in desperation. He went to Boyle. Well, let's look at the three lens eye concept to start with. <coughs> These are Orson's words. I'm going to read it. You can read it, but let's just go. Contrary to popular belief, I'll say popular, all the school children learn the wrong kind. You've been taught the wrong. I certainly was. I'll bet all of you have. The cornea has almost no power of refraction in the optical system of the eye. The normal untouched cornea has maybe half diopter of power or something like that. It's, for all, it's certainly not a 40 diopter plus lens. Since the cornea has been regarded as the most important lens of the eye for over 300 years, some explanation and proof is in order. The cornea is important optically only in shaping the anterior curve of the aqueous lens, which the residents told us is the first lens, good for the residents. If the cornea is removed mathematically, but the aqueous is kept in its former shape, ray tracing methods will reveal that the image location and quality are for all practical purposes the same. And here it is. Cornea, no power. Anterior chamber, first important lens, lens, lens. Worse than used to call it, vitreous. And that is it, assembled. Somehow, we have to get beyond where we are now <coughs> and at least teach that concept. It is so vital. I mean, we deal with the eye all the time. We say the cornea is the most important lens of the eye. Where it's we're off to start with. Orson was at dinner with some Chinese physicists one night. There are four Chinese physicists, and they said, well, Dr. White, what's, what's interesting in your field? What's, what captivates you? And Orson said, well, interesting you should ask. My colleagues think that the cornea is the most important lens of the eye, but let's take a look at a goblet here in front of us. And look through it, the ban banana's there and the banana's here. It's not enlarged, it, nothing's changed on it. You see other things through there. <coughs> it's just fine. Here's some Christmas chocolate coconut. Well, let's move the lens. <coughs> let's move the non lens, the corneal analog over in front of this. And the stripes are the same width on this as they were before. Let's put some water in it. Wow, magnifies. You made aqueous humor out of the glass there. Orson did it with wine. Nice thing about that is afterward you get to drink the real lens. <laughs> okay, and, and if you forgot your breakfast, your uh, I, reading glasses and you're there sitting there at the table for breakfast, well, no problem. Just put the newspaper behind the new lens, and there you have it magnified nicely. Okay, just a moment here. This material, by the way, is in the <coughs> tenth and eleventh edition of General Ophthalmology. The uh, chapter 24 covers optics and ray tracing and the pressure dynamics and glaucoma materials in chapter 14 in those two editions. So Orson is in print somewhere. And by the way, Orson remembered all of his mathematics and physics. He didn't forget anything. Now, <coughs> we 
we often hear the term, by the way, back to the cornea that is in the lens, we hear the term corneal power all the time. I go to that wonderful meeting, I didn't go this year, but I go to that wonderful meeting of uh, Al Crandall up at Deer Valley, and those fine, capable people come, <coughs> and they're capable in every way, but they're stuck in some terms that we have, and they talk about corneal power, but the cornea has no power. It'd be far better, instead of corneal power, to talk about corneal curvature and aqueous power. That's the real thing. And another thing <coughs> is the cornea has a different curve one way of, than another. Corneal astigmatism isn't a real thing either. It's aqueous astigmatism caused by a cornea that has different curvatures. And by the way, of the three lenses we talked about, none of them are thin lenses. So the algebraic thin lens equations are no good. You've learned them, you've seen them, you've done, tried to make out a few problems with them, forget it. Algebraic thin lens equations are, are no good. This being the case, if <coughs> the optics of the eye change when you do radial keratotomy, it's because what happens? Any, anybody back there want to say out loud what? Again, what? That it changes the aqueous humor lens. And it actually it flattens the front curve and that makes it uh, less minus. If our wonderful <coughs> oculoplastic surgeons work on the cornea and take away some tissue, then you can have a cornea that is a lens. Then you have a four lens eye because if you make the cornea a minus power lens, for someone who is in need of minus power, then yeah, it, it, it is a power lens then. But other, other than that, it is not. Let's just read the words of Orson again on method of ray tracing. Classic reference for ray tracing that Orson has found, and believe me, that is it is Applied Optics and Optical Design by Alexander Eugene Conradi, Volume 1, published in 1929, which was a long time ago. Volume 2 is delayed by the death of the author, but completed and published in 1960 by Conradi's son-in-law, Rudolph Kingslake. Conradi must have been thrilled to death when his daughter brought this Kingslake along, and he was uh, capable in the same field that Conradi was. Anyway, Rudolph Kingslake, studied under Conradi at the Imperial College in London, was director of optical design at Eastman Kodak for 30 years, taught lens design at the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester for about 45 years. Orson met Kingslake, they talked. Sometimes I think I have to try to read between the lines when I read about letters that Orson sent to other people and so on, but he met Kingslake, he was on his way to a class reunion Harvard class reunion, his medical school class. And I think, and he told Kingslake that we believe that the cornea <coughs> in ophthalmology, he didn't, but virtually everyone believed that the cornea was a lens, and Kingslake was, he just couldn't believe any of that. I, Orson might have asked his help, he might have said, what can we do to sort of teach things, make it better? And I think Kingslake didn't want to have anything to do with this. We were so far off the edge that he didn't care. There must be people of Kingslake's credentials who could help us get up to date and educate our colleagues on that. By the way, to the residents, what I'm teaching you is true. I would be careful if you're taking an oral exam. <laughs> and the senior examiner asked what the first what important lens of the eye was. You might try and answer like, well, I've been taught that that's the cornea. That would be true all the way. And if you try to smile and not quiver or anything, you might get by with it that I wouldn't try to educate that senior examiner. That might get you in trouble. But uh, somewhere along the way, we've got to do better with people understanding what, what the real thing is.
By the way, Orson's ray tracing materials are present in several places. There is an article on optics and ray tracing in, in here. One other thing, the, the article on pressure dynamics in the eye and the article on ray tracing have a date of 1992. And Orson passed away in 93. He knew he was not well the last year, whatever. And <coughs> I think he knew that it might be a good idea to update some of his fine materials. And that's why that has that particular date on it. But uh, the materials are in there. There's a lot of stuff in the pressure dynamics CI, but I want to just touch on one little thing. Orson talked to me time and again. He said, pressure, well, it's on pressure, tension, and strength. And uh, he said, pressure and tension are not the same thing. And we talk about it like we all do. We all have pressure and tension. But they aren't. This, who knows what it is? You know what it is. Tell me, Jason. Giot's tonometer. I've used it a lot before the gold ones came along, but uh, the Giot's tonometer sits on the eye and a plunger and dents the cornea a little bit. <coughs> and uh, there's a scale so you can see. Well, if you read off of the scale on the Giot's tonometer, it's so set up that it's one tenth of a millimeter of indentation <coughs> in the cornea results in a one millimeter difference on the scale, so it just makes it easy to read. And uh, then you can look at the chart, and depending upon how much weight you had to put on, if it's a real hard eye, you might be up at a 7.5 or even 10 or rarely a 15 gram total weight and get a reading. But you're reading tension. And here's an instrument we all know about, the Tana pen. And here's that lovely Goldman tonometer. Those are pressure instruments. And pressure and tension aren't the same. But what does the Moran chart say? It has a capital T, capital A, where you write down the results of whatever you do there. If you write down what you read on that under T, A, which I think might mean tension applination, well, there is no such thing as tension by applination, it's pressure by application. You're talking about that. I think our chart maybe should use a P where that T is. But thousands, hundreds of thousands of those charts have been made, and then why not be accurate? Okay. Morrison got interested in oxygen toxicity as a potential problem in retroretinal fibroplasia. He gave the paper in 1951, the one in your B papers in your, had in your folder here too. He gave the paper in 1951. <coughs> it's dated 1952. Or he, he wrote the paper at least in 51. And Morrison was interested in diving. He was interested in oxygen circumstances. He's interested in high oxygen problems that had been studied and had been reported. And for a while, between 51, 54, maybe about 54 is when everyone accepted, wow, too high up oxygen. That's, that's what makes this retroretinal fibroplasia problem. Sure, thank you. Ooh, brushing on it. Sorry. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Larson felt that oxygen was the problem. <coughs> he went to his professor, Phillips Tigerson. I think most of us have heard of Phillips Tigerson. He was one of the fine, great professors at the, of ophthalmology at the University of California. He said, what, can we do something to get the National Institute of Health to, to step in and help out on this? Because this looks like this really is it. And that time, the thinking was, it's the abrupt removal from the children in the incubator and the lower oxygen that was getting in trouble, which if or as it would have helped them. And when that was presented to the NIH by Phillips Tigerson, their answer was basically <laughs> ridiculous. And they didn't give any credibility to it. Three years later, it was the answer, and everybody knew it. Morrison felt really badly about all the blind children over a three-year span when nobody listened, when he had something. And Dr. Hagen spoke last night. I think he went to the NIH, uh, our wonderful researcher uh, in uh, <coughs> macular degeneration, 
said he was interested in that, and the guys at NIH said, well, that's a dead issue. That will always be a problem, and there will no, never be an answer, so why don't you go do something worthwhile, kind of. So the NIH did a lot of good stuff, but occasionally, well, don't go to them for your last answer. <coughs> Some other interesting things that Orson developed. He, he, he invented the battery bug. I have one. He didn't really get it out commercially, but I have one. It's really fun. It's a one and a half volt battery tester. One cute little thing that he put together. And he developed an underwater swimmer's lens. Orson liked to swim. If you are swimming without a mask, you're way, way hyperopic. But if you put that lens in front of your eyes and monocle, it's wonderful. You see really clearly. However, the first one had a lot of aberration. And that didn't discourage him totally. He developed a subsequent one. And he gave one to me and got rid of the aberration. And he cemented the two together with high-tech white silicone that you get at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. He used whatever was necessary to get the job done. But another one of his things. Orson had a family <coughs> that all had congenital cataracts. The mother did, the father did, all the kids did. A whole bunch of them. They were patients of Orson's. I, I'll bet they were all legally blind. Nobody saw very well at all. <coughs> when the new baby came, Orson was so discouraged with the other kids, they developed nystagmus so fast, so early in life, that Orson decided, I'm going to get in so early in surgery, and I'm going to do something to try to get around this nystagmus problem. So he operated with linear extraction where you needle the capsule and stir the lens cortex around, go back a week later and irrigate and irrigate it out. At that time, he glued a contact lens, just a polymethylacrylate contact lens. I don't know what the power was, plus 18, plus 20, a lot of stuff on it. He glued it on the cyanoacrylate glue, of course. He thought, this is just wonderful. He said, that baby didn't have nystagmus. And he felt he could see a big difference between that child and the previous ones he'd had. This is anecdotal, I guess, but it sure impressed him. And uh, unfortunately, epithelium grew underneath the contact lens, covered the cornea nicely, no sequelae there, no problems. And uh, that baby had far less of a nystagmus problem. <coughs> and that child at age 14, so 2025, Orson was quite pleased with that. <coughs> we were both doing some plastic heat molding of the cornea, putting a few dots of heat right at the edge, usually of the corneal graft. Both, both of us did corneal transplant work. I was using a hot wire cautery at first, but Orson said, hey, I'm using this thing. This is really fun. This is a Weller soldering station, so why not use the soldering iron on the eye instead of that crude hot wire? And here's the, uh, it shows you the tip's really quite delicate. He can hold it far down there and uh, probably usually with a, a, uh, a loop. And we could correct the curvature where, where they have some of your corneal transplants aren't round. Everybody knows that. I asked Jerry Bettman of San Francisco, I said, okay, after keratoconus, get all the silk out. What's your average astigmatism? He said, oh, five and a half diopters. He was one of the very, very fine ones. But he admitted it was about five and a half, which means some were really good and some were a lot higher. Well, we could <coughs> steepen the flat curve <coughs> and by putting heat there, and it would shrink the collagen. And everybody was happy. The patients are happy. The doctors are happy. And those corneas remembered exactly where they used to be. You know, four, six, eight weeks later, they'd be back just like they were. They put them on the keratometer, the same reading as before. It was a, a fun time to try to make something happen. And I hope conductive keratoplasty is better than what we had with the hot wire. Orson set up some soft software for a <laughs> Hewlett Packard calculator. This isn't the first one he used. He used an earlier model than this 41 CV. But he put in <coughs> software package for me. And it, it was Joe's office practice. And it was on the screen. It would pop as I called it up at a JOFP. 
it, it was wonderful. It gave keratometry extension. I used a Barcelona keratometer, and a lot of patients, a lot of my patients, are way off the scale. I couldn't get a reading, but if you put a plus 1.25, I think it was, or plus 2.25 lens right in front of the keratometer, and then you got something you could read, and you had to go to a chart and see what the reading converted to, but Orson had it all in here. He had spectacle, spectacle addition and subtraction in there, and they were wonderful. He faked patients, and there were plenty around once, once upon a time. He had thick glasses. If they went back and forth behind the ferrocter, and you were just refracting them, and they didn't have their glasses on, you had a vertex problem, and you know, your power might not be all that great. But if they had their own glasses, and you knew what the power was, and refracted them with their glasses on, then you just spectacled that, what they were wearing, what you found, order it, and it was wonderful. And subtraction's good, too, because if you refract somebody who doesn't like their old glasses and there's a change, you subtract one from the other, and then you can hold up the difference in front of them over the old glass, and they say, wow, I love it, and there you go. That's not all that necessary. Now our techs are so dang good. I just love writing down what they find. I, I'm thrilled with the techs at the Moran Eye Center. <laughs> They're just superb. My hat's off to all of you. Some of you are here. And <coughs> on the 41 CV, Orson put all of the ray tracing material in there, in my cal and I hadn't used that. I should have said, Orson, let's get together. Let's just do a few problems together with it, and I didn't do it. But bad, bad, bad oversight on my part. Orson wanted to do something on the pathophysiology of eye trauma, <coughs> and he set it up first. To show one thing, he set it up so that he had a beaker sitting on the snow in the wintertime, and he knew the laws of ballistics are very interesting on this. Uh, if a missile, let me just give you the words, I wrote it out, be careful. When a missile penetrates a fluid, it continues onward until it has displaced a mass of the fluid equal to its own mass. And, this is f and the formula is real easy. You d divide the specific gravity of the missile by the fluid into which it goes and multiply it by the missile length. Well, if it's in water, the specific gravity of water is 1, and a bullet going in there is the specific gravity of 11. That gives you 11 to multiply by the length. So, kaboom, you fire a bullet into water. How far does it go? If it's 1 inch long and made of lead, 11 inches, and then it flutters down to the bottom. It doesn't go a long way in there. Some air aviators in World War II were on a life raft when their bomber crashed. They'd been out for 27 days, and they'd gone over 1,000 miles south and west. But they'd heard a <coughs> reciprocal engine coming up, and they thought, wow, maybe this is, you know, maybe this is our guys, and they'll take care of us. Well, it was the enemy. And they opened fire on these guys. They went over the side of the raft and swam underneath, and they could see the trajectory of the bullet from the water it disturbed, and they found it only went just a short way, and then it dropped. They were just astounded. That's in the book, uh, oh, the book Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand. An amazing book. But that, that shows it. Well, anyway, Orson wanted to get some pressure on this beaker with chilled carol syrup, which must act like it has a high specific gravity. So he took it out on New Year's Eve, which, as he stated it, he, he went out to do this on <coughs> New Year's Eve so someone might not call the cops. He fired his 357 Magnum into this beaker with the chilled carol syrup, and poof, it went down. Didn't disturb, it didn't break the, the beaker, and uh, that was part of the setup for his experiment. <laughs> Fertile mind. He developed the depth gauge for divers. He was always interested in swimming, always interested in diving, and <coughs> he developed the get depth gauge for, for divers. So he could go down, 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 get his free scuba, and uh, he put an awful lot of whatever money he had, not that he had a lot, but he said uh, he expended a major part of his modest resources, this is 1947, to clear the depth gauge for swimmers for a patent. But then he couldn't get anyone to finance it. They said, who wants to know how deep in the water they are except for you? They wouldn't even listen to him. Well. And later others did care when scuba became a craze. But that's something he had. He had the depth gauge. It never happened. 
Well, I don't know who Reuben is for the American Academy. Anybody know Reuben? Too bad the professor Randy isn't here. Anyway, <coughs> Reuben turned down a manual that Orson had developed. Had he prepared it for the American yeah, Academy? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, some of the higher ups in optics. I think we're a little afraid of Orson because they didn't understand what Orson was and what he was talking about. But Reuben turned down this manual that Orson had prepared on ray tracing, saying it was too complicated for the residents. Orson agreed that all residents would not want to learn this, but all should know it, know that it exists, and it's the proper method, as we've been talking about today, even if only 12 knew it, or even if only he Reuben knew it. I think Orson's so frustrated that he probably fired that shot straight across the bow at Reuben <laughs> in a letter. But I don't think Reuben understood it at all. And I don't think our residents are incapable of learning that sort of thing either. So I don't take any part of that in. But others high in high places have been resistant. I think we are at a point where we hope that someone will come along <coughs> and help get this proper information propagated. I know there are people who care about ray tracing. And I, the Lloyd Williams of the world are the ones maybe we'll have to count on. Lloyd is interested, our own Lloyd Williams. And isn't that wonderful, what a, an engineer, ophthalmologist? Because the optical engineers all believe in what I'm saying. They don't have any problem. We have a problem because we learned something else. Well, Orson was a remarkable and predict, pr productive and capable human being. He was patient with those who did not yet understand what he was saying, but were trying to do so. And he, he had a great sense of humor through it all. I just want to tell you one little story at the conclusion. We were operating one day. I was doing a cornea transplant on a Native American. And this, this Native American was a stand-up comic. He was lying down for his surgery happily. But he was a very funny guy, and he said, in the middle of the operation, he said, hey, doc, you ever hear about the three cowboys, er, no, the three chiefs and the cowboy? I said, no, tell me the story, because <laughs> he told me so many funny stories. He said, well, the, the Indians set up a deal where the cowboy could use some of their land for, his, for grazing land, and so they were smoking the peace pipe. And the first chief, chief, he looked out over the water, and he thought how his canoes went so smoothly over the water, and he could fish in the water for fish, and he... He loved that, and he just thought about that part of the beautiful environment where they were, and he took a puff from the pipe. And the second Indian took the pipe, and he looked at the sky, and he thought that the eagle flies through the air, and the eagle needs so much to them, and rain comes through the air, and they did have some corn crops, and he appreciated all of that, and, and so he took a puff. And then the cowboy took the pipe, and he looked out over all the waving grass, and he thought of how his cattle would get fat on that, and streams were running through it. He pulled out his handkerchief and he wiped off the end of the pipe and he took a puff. And the last chief, he looked in the forest nearby and he thought, that's where the deer run and I'm a great hunter and I love to sneak through the forest. It's so easy to go through there quietly and just uh, <coughs> enjoy that. And, and he pulled out his knife and he cut off the end of the pipe and he took a puff. And at that point, Orson said, you, he brave Indians. Tell a story like that about cowboy while a white man had a knife in your eye. <laughs> <laughs> but that was Orson. He was, he was up to the situation, whatever. So, wonderful to be here and talk about these things. Are, it, are there any questions? It's in there. Read those things. Read them all. Read them through, word for word. Think about it. And we... We need to educate our colleagues. I hope you've enjoyed this. The things you've heard today are true. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to thank Randy Miller for helping me. He helped. I did some of the setup before I came to Randy, but he helped get that little movie of the flying put on there. He helped me with many, many things. Randy is the best. We all know that. But
just take whatever Thanks, left Joel, over. for doing that. That was really interesting. Um, a, do you have a picture of what he looks like? Because, you know, oh, I came seven, and I'm sure I met him, but I don't remember him. Of course, you know. I'll, I'll look into that. For the library? Yeah. Would you like a... Uh, we, the PowerPoint. We're going to put that into our intra, our, our repository. Yeah, so we well, do want it. This is what I talked from. Oh, great. Oh, we'll put that in too. We'll scan it. Do you have the 